Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 206th New Social Environment. I'm Emily Dean, a production assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for the first Radical Poetry Reading of 2020, curated by Bennett Bergman. We're also thrilled to have the poets Myra A. Rodriguez Castro, Shiv Kotecha, Laylee Long Soldier, and Benjamin Cruzling here with us today. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAdey, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyan Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country, and acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability, and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our curator, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's curator. Bennett Bergman is a writer in New York. He's also the founding editor of Changes, a new nonprofit book publisher. Bennett, take it away. Um, hi everyone. I uh, thank thanks for that introduction, Emily. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. I love the Brooklyn Rail, and I love this radical poetry reading series. I think it's a um, a great resource and a great platform for writers. If this is your first time coming to this space, um, welcome, and I hope that you'll continue to come back. I also just want to thank and congratulate the Brooklyn Rail team. Um, who's been putting together just a really consistently and astonishingly good, inspiring program um, from the very beginning, of course, but I mean, since the beginning of the pandemic um, with these lunchtime meetings, the new social environment. So thank you um, to the team at the rail for holding this space, um, for inviting me here. And thank you to everyone who is um, here today to hear from um our readers uh also happy happy new year i like to keep just saying that for as long as it feels <laughs> tenable to keep saying happy new year happy new year everybody um it's really exciting to see um that at least we have um one victory in georgia it's just an exciting it's an exciting new year um I'll try to keep this introduction brief. I'm mostly just really happy to be able to bring together this group of wonderful poets and um, writers and thinkers. The word radical is, I mean, it's just kind of, it's its a little bit daunting. Um, it creates this expectation that's, it, 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 sets a, it sets a high bar, creates an expectation that can feel a bit hard to meet. Um, I don't think the radical is just about deconstruction. It has to involve imagining something and that's always tricky. So you have to think obviously about what kinds of poets does it make sense to invite to such a reading. And each poet has to think about what kinds of poems does it make sense to read? Uh, what kinds of poems deserve that honorific um, of the radical? Um, and everyone will think of different things, of course, works that represent or constitute different visions of the radical and what could be, but isn't yet, um, and how to bring it about. So that's what I love about this series and why I'm always excited to hear um, what's been radicalizing for other thinkers. And I'm excited to hear from each of these poets, Ma Myra, Shiv, uh, Laylee, and Benjamin. Um, before I, I just want, I want to take one second. I feel like it would be a wasted opportunity not to. I want to take a second to tell you about a new book prize for poets that I've been working on this year, um, awarding 
uh, publication and uh, $10,000 for a first or second book of poems. The judge this year is um, the poet Louise Glick. And the prize is called the Bergman Prize, named uh, in memory of my parents, uh, the second of whom I lost just before the pandemic. And it's a strange thing to have um, a death like that make something possible. It's about giving support to, to something that you love and something that I hope will be wonderful. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about how loss um, can be radicalizing, how grief can be radicalizing um, for the way it can just unmoor a person from their foundations. I think we saw that on a large scale in the past year with the ways people organized um, in protest uh, of the state sanctioned killings of black Americans like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Elijah McClain. Um, two, two radical poets that we've lost in the past year that I love are um, Diane De Prima and, and John Giorno. There's been a lot of Diane De Prima um, read in this series, um, which makes sense because her revolutionary letters are perfect for this kind of space. Um, and it's just brought me a lot of joy to see her life and her work celebrated in, in, in that way. And I feel like it can, it, it, it's worth continuing to do that. So I want to, I want to read something short by, again, I read, I read, uh, Diane DePrima the last time that I was here, but, um, want to read something of hers again. Um, and the same goes for John Giorno. Penny Arcade wrote an amazing piece in the Brooklyn Rail after John Giorno died, um, remembering the work he did with um, his, AIDS, his AIDS initiative, um, what today we would call mutual aid, finding money to give um, to people who were living with AIDS um, and just trying to reallocate resources to where they were needed. So. Um, I want to read a piece by each of them and just kind of take it as an opportunity to reflect on the radical potential of mutual aid um, and new, 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 new economies that are about. Um, I don't. I, I guess that I'm just thinking about when capital suffuses so much and so much, so many of our daily interactions. How how something like mutual aid can be radical as a way of reallocating value and restructuring systems of value. Um, and so there's the first thing that I want to read is just this piece from um, You Gotta Burn Bright to Shine, which is one of, uh, one of the selected writing collections of John Giorno. And it's just called AIDS Monologue. It's not a poem, it's, it's prose, but um, that's one of the things that I want to read just to open this reading. It's, uh, he, he writes, I run the AIDS treatment project that helps people with AIDS by giving them cash grants for any reason. Back rent, the telephone bill, medicine not covered by Medicaid, nursing, taxis, food, money for anything that is needed, money given with love and affection. I began the AIDS treatment project in 1984 in response to the earth shattering catastrophe of the AIDS epidemic. For me, it was an attempt with a burning passion in my heart to help individuals suffering from AIDS. The simple realization came to me that what a person with AIDS needs most is money. A person with AIDS often feels abandoned and trapped in their daily circumstances, and a person with AIDS is often doing quite well dealing with each problem as it arises, trying to build a stronger immune system, thriving and surviving, as they say. And a person with AIDS has often lost everything or is about to lose their life. We try to relieve them, if only for a moment, from worrying about money. We have never refused anyone money. My intention is to treat a complete stranger as a lover or close friend. In the same spirit as in the golden age of promiscuity, we made fabulous love with beautiful strangers and celebrated life with glorious substances. God, please fuck my mind for good. Now that their life is ravaged with AIDS, we offer love from the same root in the form of boundless compassion. My way is to give money and strong emotional support. I do it personally and directly. I bring it to the hospital or to the person's apartment or he, she comes to my house, whatever is needed. Compassion without partiality 
uh, directed at every individual person with AIDS. I hug them as good friends, as they are, or as 10 years ago, I might have had fabulous sex with absolute abandon with the same stranger. I am saying this because I want to encourage you to help someone with AIDS. I know you don't need to be convinced you already know the facts, want to help and to do, but I'm saying it again one more time to inspire you to help someone or help someone you're helping some more. Being generous doesn't cost anything. We give money free. It doesn't cost anything to give money. It doesn't cost anything for me to talk to you or for you to talk to me. You don't have to charge money for writing a check. You don't have to charge money for being professional. You just do it. Giving money is one of the sweetest songs anyone can sing. I have never wanted to make the AIDS treatment project into another large age organization with a big budget, staff, and payroll. Giorno Poetry Systems receives no management fee or percentage. There are no salaries, no administration expenses, and no fundraising fees. All work is given free and all money goes directly to help people with AIDS. Giorno Poetry Systems absorbs any most miscellaneous expenses. I simply do what I do whenever an idea arises to help a need, I follow it and make the idea come into being. Whenever I'm asked, I can't say no. The point is, if I can do it, so can you. I spend one or two hours a day, seven days a week, every week, every month, every year, and I'm happy to be able to do it. I am HIV negative through some miracle, as I am sure I came into contact with the AIDS virus, but somehow I'm negative. I am a gay man. I am 55 years old, and I have lived most of my life being infinitely promiscuous, but for the mere last 10 years. I am saying this to encourage everyone who is HIV negative to help someone with AIDS and help a stranger. It is easy to help a friend or a relative or a lover because you are attached to them and you want to, but help a stranger with the same feeling as you would a friend. This might seem like a job for medical professionals or for HIV positive people to help themselves from self-interest. It is our job too. It won't kill you and you don't get infected or tainted. In fact, it is a purifying experience. When you become familiar with a problem, fear falls away allowing help to arise from simple compassion. The intention is indiscriminate compassion, non-discriminating compassion, not making distinctions between people, not I'll help this one, but not that one, because I don't know him, but helping everyone with AIDS. There is always just enough resources to help everyone. Give whatever you can and loving kindness. And, you know, obviously that's written in a specific historical moment, but in a time when there's just a lot of need um, and there are many kinds of resources to be reallocated, not just capital, um, but loving kindness um, and time and energy. It just seemed like in a time of pandemic, I, I um, appreciated reading reading that. Um, and so the piece by Diane DePrima, shorter, that I uh, want to read is Revolutionary Letter Number 9. Um, I think also some a poem that has to do with reimagining systems of value. Um, advocating, advocating the overthrow of government is a crime Overthrowing it is something else altogether. It is sometimes called revolution, but don't kid yourself. Government is not where it's at. It's only a good place to start. One, kill head of Dow chemical. Two, destroy plant. Three, make it unprofitable for them to build again, i.e destroy the concept of money as we know it, get rid of interest, savings, inheritance, pounds money as dated coupons that come in the mail to everyone and are void in 30 days is still a good idea. Or let's start with no money at all and invent it if we need it. Or mimeograph it and everyone print as much as they want and see what happens. Declare a moratorium on debt. 
the Continental Congress did on all debts, public and private, and no one owns the land. It can be held for use, no man holding more than he can work himself and family working. Let no one work for another except for love and what you make above your needs to be needs be given to the tribe, a commonwealth. None of us knows the answers. Think about these things. The day will come when we will have to know the answers. Um, so with that, um, I think I, I'd just like to hand it off to so that we can hear from the four the four readers that um, that I've invited here today, and we're going to start by hearing from um, from Myra, and I think that Emily is going to inter introduce. Yeah, thank you so much, Bennett. Um, that was so beautiful, and thank you for bringing everyone together here today. Um, First, we will hear from Myra. Myra A. Rodriguez Castro is a writer and translator. Rodriguez is the editor of Audre Lorde Dream of Europe, Selected Seminars and Interviews, 1984 to 1992 from Kenning Editions 2020. Her writing and contributions appear in Social Text Journal, The Poetry Project Newsletter, South as a State of Mind, among others. And Myra, I'm passing it over to you. Great. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you, Bennett, for the invitation. And I'm so honored to read with all these amazing poets and thinkers. Um, the first thing I had to think about was what a political poem means for me and what constitutes a political poem. So I will be sharing a version of what political poetry means for me today. Um, and I will start with a poem by Jay Wright. I will move in and out of poems of my own and um, weave them with other voices that follow me and accompany me as usual. Jay Wright beginning again. I've come back so slowly to here, trying to remember how I came here then. What sense of speaking brought me to this place? My history is like a bird's flying away, nesting. Wherever sun and some small charity are offered to me, pecking in rain and ill fortune when they come only to survive as one whose virtue is flying. But I am more than a bird and less, being weighted and buoyed by a sense of tongues, being kept in my voluntary flight because I am impressed with weight other than my own being sure that my routes are chosen, sure that there is a changeless place that holds me that will not be shaken. So leave the history of birds, even their ash scented flowering, even their holy beauty. I return to tell how I come back so slowly, so carefully to hear where you see me now. When no thing is named. When no thing is named, how safe to be beautiful. In the morning, a whole body prepared. When water is milk and green, you are my place. A palm on my chest detecting the middle. Where sun warms 
your veins are threads, one entering the other. I hear your breath, faint, living. I am awake as rain wets the sea. Streams. Words bear us no resemblance, but traces rise and sink the way one touches a stranger inadequately. What is the name for segments of a stream, a phase drawn by rain, her eye folds, fragile casings of thought? I'm going to read now one of my favorite poems um, by Li Yong Li. Arise, go down. It wasn't the bright hems of the Lord's skirts that brushed my face and I opened my eyes to see from a cleft in rock his backside. It's a wasp perched on my left cheek. I keep my eyes closed and stand perfectly still in the garden until it leaves me alone. Not to contemplate how this century ends and the next one begins with no one I know having seen God, but to wonder why I get through most days unscathed, though I live in a time when it might be otherwise and I grow more fatherless each day. For years now, I have come to conclusions without my father's help. Discovering on my own what I know, what I don't know and seeing how one cancels the other. I've become a scholar of cancellations. Here I stand among my father's roses and see that what punctures outnumbers what consoles. The cruel and the tender never make peace. The one climbs, the one descends. Petal by petal to the hidden ground no one owns, I see that which is taken away by violence and persuasion. The rose announces on earth the kingdom of gravity. A bird cancels it. My eyelids cancel the bird. Anything might cancel my eyes, distance, time, war. My father said, never take your both eyes off the world before he rocked me. All night we waited for the knock that would have signal, all clear, come now. It would have meant escape, it never came. I didn't make the world I leave you with, he said. And then being poor, he left me only this world in which there is always a family waiting in terror before the rendered, this world wherein a man might rise, go down and walk along a path and, pa and pause and bow to roses, roses that his father raised and admired them for one moment unable, thank God, to see in each and every flower the world canceling itself. woven in all things. Who has dried sugar in its benign state? And white powders, our executions have been quiet, woven in all things. I will read two more poems of my own, and then I will close with a poem by 
at Robertson. This day, I saw you in the first animal I held in my mother's bones. The lines of her persist as an early sincerity. The sun slept on rows of grass and stone and there sitting above green, my eyes, my arms were interpreted and anything before this day had led to you. As cause. To ask for restoration, not knowing the enemy or the crime to reject their tentatives and walk silently, breathing the question of God in the smell of people. And to wither as surges lean on our humble poses, as bones surpass our event, as suns go absent, we learn our radius unstrained from justice. I like to think of this poem by Ed Robertson as my favorite political poem right now. Be careful. I must be careful about such things as these. The thin grained oak, the quiet grizzlies scared into the hills by the constant tracks squeezing in behind them closer in the snow. The snared rigidity of the winter lake, deer after deer, crossing on the spines of fish who look up and stare with their eyes pressed to the eyes in sleep. Hearing the thin taps leading away to collapse like the bear in the high quiet. I must be careful not to shake anything in too wild elation, not to jar the fragile mountains against the far paperness, nor avalanche the fog or the eagle from the air of the gentle wilderness. I must set the precarious words like rocks without one snow capped mistake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Myra. That was so wonderful to listen to. Um, next, we will hear from Shiv Kotecha. Shiv Kotecha is the author of The Switch from Wonder and Extrigue from Make Now Books. Writes regularly for Freeze Magazine. He holds a PhD in English from New York University and teaches a poetry seminar for NYU's XE Experimental Humanities and Social Engagement Master's Program. Over to you, Shiv. Um, thank you, Emily and Bennett um, and Myra and everyone at the rail. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, in thinking about political poetry uh, this morning, I was drinking coffee before going to work and decided to put together just a few things that I've been reading lately um, that have to do with labor, work, um, following instructions, obedience. Um, and so I'll just be reading a few different things. Um, and I'll, here's what I'll read. So there's no surprises. Um, I'm gonna read a small excerpt from my own work within this also, but I'll tell you what they are. Um, I'll read from Saidiya Hartman's um, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments first from a section called Manual for General Housework. <clears throat> Manual of or pertaining to the hand or hands done or performed with the hands. Now, especially of physical labor, an occupation, et cetera, opposed to mental, theoretical, an occupation, uh, theoretical manual as distinguished from the mind and the intellectual manual as of a weapon, tool, implement, etc., that is used or worked with the hand or hands, actually in one's hands, not merely perspective, 
manual, short for manual exercises, i.e. physical labor and not the exercise of reason or imagination. A tool or an object within one's grasp, not speculative, not a proposal for black female genius. The use of the body as tool or instrument of occupation or possession, able to have in one owns one's own hands, as in possession is three-fifths of the law, as in possession makes you three-fifths of a human, as in property handled by another. Also to be possessed, to be handled as if owned, annexed, branded, invaded, ingested, not autonomous, manual, to be wielded by another, to be wielded on a whim, to be wielded as an exercise of another's will, to be severed from one own, one's own will or motives or desires, manual, as opposed to mental, as in not an exercise of rational faculties, as opposed to the formation of critical reflections, as opposed to the contemplation of the self or of the world, a method of operating or working, a function, short for manual exercise, short for manual tool. As related a handle, as to be handled, as to be handled with no regard, as to be handled as a tool or instrument, as to be handled like a slave, like a wench, like a bitch, like a whore, handled as pertaining to that part of the thing which is to be grasped by the hand in using it or moving it, to be grasped by the hand or sometimes by the neck, the ass, the throat, Colloquial, to fly off the handle, to go into a rage, to fuck shit up, figurative, that by which something is or may be taken a hold of, one or two or more ways in which a thing may be taken or apprehended, to manipulate, manage, to subject to the hands of ha action of hands, to touch or feel with hands, as opposed to don't touch me, as pertaining to hands up, don't shoot, to manage, conduct, direct, control, to be handled by men, to be manhandled, to be seized by men, to be used by men, to be used up by men. Handled as relating to the use of the thing, to do something with the tool as opposed to directed by will and desire, as opposed to consent, as opposed to leave me the fuck alone, to deal with, to treat as you wish, to serve, to use, to accumulate, to expend, to deplete. Manual as related to a book, etc. Of the nature of a man annual intended to be kept at hand for reference, a concise trade abridgment, a handbook. Um, and this is uh, Alice Notley's, everyone's out over some emotional action. Where are we in this dark copes? Thank God I got here. Shadows on Mitch Ham's face. The process of leveling is proceeding too erratically. Can't concentrate, must change. I say, sigh because I hate to be so deliberate. Dreamed of a poetry institution, several rooms resembling a bank, windows with grills. There are no bathrooms. If you must shit, do it at the threshold between rooms. A veil descends to cover you during the act and then the extrusion itself seems magically to disappear. I shit at a couple of thresholds but finally get up to leave, skip out of the building, sunshine outside for a change. At times I've been bad. Am I interested? No, I am not interested. Hurt people's feelings? A, sus a suspect category of happenstance. A group of 10 or so liberals rob a bank to publicize their cause. As a result, a woman I know well is now both lacking an arm and dead. She and I stand discussing this near steep drop in the landscape. I may be dead too, but I am not a liberal. In the next stream, I will slide off slide down a cliff, slide down at the bottom of the dam, a dam's not a cliff now suggested, would be that white foamed emerald water I've always been terrified of. It's what's at the bottom of the Hoover Dam. I guess I have to slide down that damned conservative dam and join the scary water. I'll get washed through where, I'll get washed through where the river, nothing but the river, non-political. Sluggish going to the door for the mail. So the mailman drove a bulldozer through the front of the house. The mail would, was deposited by the dirt eater ma into the floor. The news has arrived. I go about just detached from the emotion and not in your story. When I remember, it's a physical sense of detachment, a sack no longer adhering to a flesh wall having been ripped away. Leaving people at a cafe, I can cross the river to my other room. Of course, I have two and change my clothes. My room over here is a dark one. When I open my jewelry boxes, voices talk referring to me in the third person saying things like, we're Alice's jewels, she's with us now. 
but the earrings I want aren't in this room. They're back in the other one, though I see some edible earrings and also some amethyst and emeralds. Having trouble feeling involved with the news, same old men, same old no one to say to them, piss off, I'm tired of this spotlit figure form of government. So at this large hotel toward the eight o'clock morning, night had become day. There was a lake outside, lots of people, they said they wanted to see the monster, something like the Loch Ness monster. Sightings have been reported in that very lake. Then I saw it, a skate-like fish. Though not flat, the size of a whale, pale, delicately modeled, tumbling, absolutely lovely. People said, there it is, but not excitedly, and then left. One woman selling beads to the tourists said to me, you were so lucky to have seen it, but hadn't she seen it? Not really. It didn't seem to make an impression on anyone but me. I've awakened knowing I've seen it, seen it in life. Um, this is from Steve Zoltansky's On the Literary Means of Representing the Powerful as Powerless. Excerpt from a new story entitled, Bright Red Bird Escapes from Edinburgh Zoo. A rare bird has escaped from Edinburgh Zoo and is on the loose in the city after a squirrel chewed a hole at the top of its cage. Keepers noticed the scarlet ibis was missing and it was later spotted three miles away in Dundas Street, close to the city center. The bird is believed to have escaped through a hole in netting which covers its enclosure. It is in danger of being attacked by predators because of its bright colors. Um, I'm going to read a couple pages from Monica Della Torre's book, um, The Happy End, All Welcome, um, which begins with a sort of conceit. Um, this is written after Martin Kippenberger's installation, The Happy End of Franz Kafka's America, an assortment of numbered tables and office desks with pairs of mismatched chairs within a soccer field flanked by grandstands, which references a giant job fair held of the by the Nature Theater of Oklahoma in Kafka's Unfinished America, a novel Kippenberger claimed never to have read. Positions available. All are welcome. Anyone who wants to become an artist should contact us. Anyone who wants to be an artist, step forward. We can make use of everyone, each in their place. We have a place for everyone, everyone in their place. Anyone thinking of their future belongs in our midst. Anyone thinking of their future, your place is with us. And we congratulate here and now those who have decided in our favor. If you decide to join us, we congratulate you here and now, the company. Career track. Did you start off quietly at the very bottom and try to work your way up bit by bit? Did you start off with a very small job and then work your way up by industry and application? Did you start at an age in which the more advanced of your peers were almost ready to move on to better jobs? Do you wanna keep thinking that in the lives of others have a, an advantage over you that you need to make up for, make up for with greater indus, industry and a certain degree of self-denial? Have you ever felt that your work hasn't, as you had hoped, turned out to be a prelude to some higher position, but rather that you've been pushed out of it into something even lower? Have you ever tried out every conceivable position for the sake of variety? Think about it, really. It isn't out of the question that you might be chosen and might one day sit as a worker at your desk and look out of your open window with no worries for a while. Available positions. Sitting erect, pelvis curled out, cross-legged or with legs parallel. Slumping. Pelvis curled in. Sitting erect, slightly leaning forward, resting elbows and arms on desk. Reclining on chair, propping up feet on desk. Sitting against back of chair, cross-legged or with legs parallel. Plopped, arms over armrests, legs open wide. Facing backward with legs wrapping around back of chair. Propped up by chair while standing. Propping elbows on an open book, on desk, hand supporting forehead, or smoothing out hair. Plunked, head sunk into chest. What's your position? Assistant director calls through megaphone. 
call for feeling manufacturers, use color to shape the public's emotions and add a lingual jingo and bingo. Assistant director screams into a megaphone. Anybody else? One more with feeling. A random passerby who fancies himself a game changer joins in. Assistant director, hollering. Rate the performance. Did the previous works match the color they have been assigned? Did you feel blue? Did blue feel blue? Red made you feel blank. If yellow gave you anxiety, please contact the company's management. Um, now I'm gonna read a very short scene from um, my book, The Switch, uh, which in which a character is masturbating and gets really caught up into the detail of a porn scene he's watched many, many times. Um, and uh, there's it's sort of, it just goes into this sort of scene um, of shooting. Um, the lighting is probably about 90% of what the film crew has to pay attention to when they're setting up a porn scene, one that you've seen too much, 100 times, the same scene until the video itself begins to shudder, its contents suddenly rendered unfamiliar and disfigured inside the screen that you've propped up on your chest like an iron curtain where your face are, where your, where your eyes are, and your legs where your dick is. Or maybe not. Maybe after making sure the lighting matches the bodies, they have to make sure the ambient sound is okay or if it's not too cold in the room. There are so many things a crew has to do before they shoot and to modify until the deed is done. Fascinating, you think, that Ace and Jacob probably had to maintain for the whole day, maybe even two, the elements of their chemistry that really made their attraction for each other seem totally believable and rich to others. Skeptics of love like yourself, crucial make it or break it moments in the sequence, even if it will all be re rearranged in post anyway. Pauses punctuate the cast's and crew's day, while two men who are fucking say nothing to each other, men who aren't fucking speak. As when the director Joe, who cares for his craft, who's really worked at it, turns to his lighting guy for assistance. Hey, Hank. Could you come up here and put a little more light up to Ace's sack? Yeah, do, do you see that? Yeah, I'm not really getting anything down there. I don't, you know, it's just, it's a fucking pink ass walnut. That's all I see. It really needs some light on the sack down there. You got anything? Hank, Stan, Joe, and the rest of the sweaty crew take turns speaking to one another, fidgeting around ass and Ace and Jacob, who are working their asses off on a long day, long two day shoot to successfully display the men taking turns penetrating one another. Sometimes Joe checks in. How you doing Ace? We're gonna need you to keep it in there just like that. For just, just a few more minutes, try getting up on your your tiptoes, yeah, like that. Yeah, that's good. And like before, just keep your, keep your fist on the small part of his back. That's right, okay, we're good. And Ace checks in with Jacob, is that okay? Yes, dad, I'm fine actually. Certain angles you imagine must have been especially difficult to light due to the fact that one of the guys is white and the other guy is brown, a difference in skin surface that the lighting crew had to prepare for. They must have had to make some kind of sacrifice of brown ace plowing white Jacob at this angle so beautifully, like cutting the actor's salary so as to have enough for Mark, the more wise and flighting assistant to be there, for instance. Ace looks like a goddamn monkey. Look at his goddamn ears, uh, says Mark. No offense, Ace, you guys are doing great, really, just awesome. But Mark, look at that though. Should I put that light here? Can we go again? They set up some more lights. Oh my God, now look at him, look at his ass. That looks, literally looks like the moon mark. It looks like he's mooning me. I don't need to see that, Joe complains, kneeling down to look from a different angle. He's actually got a great ass, but this looks like shit. Mark, you got that ultra fire light, right? Mark unzips his backpack and pulls out the ultra fire mini XPE Q5 he picked up earlier that day. This guy is just what you need. Do you wanna get down there with it? Mark nervously crabs beneath the couple with his ultra fire strapped to a pole. He remembers briefly being a film student who never knew how to light anything. 
He tries not to get insecure about it, reminding himself that he is rich and good at talking and that he is needed on this set and that this light will please Joe and that it will address the actor's white and brown surfaces uniquely. I'm gonna shape this sack right here like you've never seen, he says, looking over at Joe while burning Ace's right ass cheek with his light. Ace holds sil still silently inside Jacob. Mark again shoves the bulb into the curve of Ace's ass. Fuck. Sorry, man, don't worry from where I'm standing, from where this shot is, you, no one's gonna even see that. You're fucking burning my ass, man. This is gonna look great. They shoot more. Fuck, 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 that fucking hurts, man. I'm losing it. At this point, Jacob, the dissociating bottom, paler than ever, chimes in. What the hell? I don't know what the fuck's going on, babe, this fucker. We're good, let's just go, I'm tired. Fuck, I'm sorry, I did it again. Dude, come on. The crew, the crew pauses the otherwise smooth shooting to medicate the burns. They decide to reshoot the entire scene from the other side of the room so as to avoid getting Ace's blotchy burn on cam. As they move everything over, they realize they didn't need such a complicated setup in the first place. They let Mark go and continue. The AD, also named Mark, takes charge and makes the crew run fast as they've only rented the ranch for two days. He forces them all, Joe the director, and Hank and Stan and Ace and Jacob to skip their lunch hour so that they can make it to their later ex than expected deadline. Um, I'm gonna read uh, two more things actually. Um, skipping around the list. This is an untitled poem by um, Pat Parker. In English lit, they told me Kafka was good because he created the best nightmares ever. I think I should go find that professor and ask why we didn't study the San Francisco Police Department. Um, and I'm just, I skipped a few things, but I'm going to uh, read one poem by Thulani Davis, Thulani Davis from this book, Nothing But the Music. Um, it's called Zoom, The Commodores. I once drove to Atlantic City in the middle of the night. I crept through a thunderstorm for the spinners, Harold, Melvin, and the Blue Notes, and mother, father, sister, brother, otherwise known as MFSB. I lost my voice for love ever since doo-wop. I've been weak for the sound of Philadelphia. It's well known. I remember the Howard, the Apollo, a few roadhouses, and even Esther's orbit room. Sweaty, funky, overweight, underbuilt joints, where you could buy to satisfy any one of your senses, where romance flourished in the garish pink lights and sweet night of the coasters slash the temps and sweet Smokey's miracles. Oh, where the romance had a chance. Was the chance the only chance any of us had? Young college students don't like to discuss it. Young poets, young, young poets eschew it. But after the club harem and sandy crab cakes under conch lights and dawn drunks across the street, I found the Commodores. Known for the profound rhymes of our times, like it's slippery when it's wet. The tasteless fleshiness of the 70s can be redeemed if you just learn to Zoom. Zoom saves love and rescues romance. Zoom. I'd like to just take a moment and dream my dreams. Zoom, you Commodores, with all the floodlight ardor and corn, with all the foolish sincerity of a man who don't care, who knows about his Jones, his love, his woman, his sweet thing, his squeeze, his weakness, his nose that a truck could run up, his crush, his sun, his moon, his starship, the sunshine of his life, the apple of his eye, his queen, his dream, his Zoom. You can tell me all that, I don't mind, Zoom, I'm with you, Commodores. Talking trash is one of the lost arts of making love and giving humanity a break. Zoom, I'm with you, Commodores, because you meant it and you loved her and you did fly to that good woman who waited, who waited for her baby, her man, her Jones, her sweet daddy, her good thing, her love, her only one, her son, her moon, sweet nights in June, her honey, her sweetheart, her ship that was coming and her Zoom, you Commodores. Maybe you are the best of us. And 
can love and believe all our foolish triteness and the way we can't talk when it's important and the way that can keep death waiting till we see those eyes one more time. Zoom, I love you, Commodores. I wanna fly away from here too. Zoom, I love you. When you call in the night because you couldn't catch a cab because you see things in the dark, Zoom, I love you when you use the subterfuge to get me alone, when you drop hints or drop by, when you promise me everything because I'm so divine. Zoom, I love you because you won't say no because you don't want to go because it's cruel, so cruel without love. Give me the tacky grandeur of Atlantic City on the 4th of July, the corny promises of Motown. Give me the romance and the Zoom. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shiv. That was incredible. Um, next, we will hear from Laylee Long Soldier. Laylee Long Soldier earned a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and an MFA with honors from Bard College. She is the author of the chapbook Chromosomery 2010 and the full length collection Whereas 2017, which won the National Books Critics' Choice Critics Circle Award and was a finalist for the National Book Award. All right, over to you, Lily. Hi, um, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so sad that we don't get to be with each other in person, but this is also exciting that we get to be uh, together from so many places. And I'm so grateful to you uh, for the invitation to be here. And as I said earlier, um, I see so many familiar faces and names um, joining us today and uh, that I'll be read that I'm reading with. And so anyway, I'm very grateful. Um, on the idea of radical, I was thinking about this idea of radical, of radical poetry or radical acts and the time that we're in right now. And so um, um, I chose some readings that maybe have to do with the thinking I have in the moment on that. And one of those ideas, uh, one of the things I have been thinking about is uh, what it is to be a relative and to see the world around us, as everyone as our relatives. How does that change things? And even beyond uh, our human relatives to see all of, all of the world, all of creation as our relatives, how does that change how we interact? Uh, uh, our awareness of what we do and what we say. And so I feel like that's a radical idea, but it's also a very ancient idea. <laughs> and I'll be reading some work uh, in a few minutes that relates to that. And then there are other things I've been thinking about. Bennett, uh, when you mentioned uh, grief. And so this is a time also of grieving. And there are things that I've heard, I've been told about that, that place of grieving and those who are grieving, that they are in, you, you might say, a kind of sacred space because everything, all the barriers between them and the rest of the world are removed. And so there's a kind of purity and there's a kind of insight um, that they have, a truth telling. And so I honor anyone who, you know, uh, I think a lot of us are in that stage right now for different reasons. Um, but those are things that I'm also thinking about today. So without further delay, I'm gonna start by reading a few pieces from this book, which came out this year, uh, titled Slow Scrape by a writer named Tanya Lucan Linklater. Uh, and I'll, I'll type it into the chat bar uh, in a few, when I'm done, um, if you wanna look at it. She is a friend actually, and she is a Lutik from Alaska and she resides in Canada right now. 
Um, I'm going to read a few pieces and then I'll move into a couple pieces of my own. Um, this is titled For Midden, found by Marianne Barkhouse near her home on the side of the road and cast in porcelain by her hands. Midden, this begins with a definition um, and then it departs into other directions. Midden, a noun. One, a, a dung hill, a dung heap, a refuse heap, also a domestic ash pit. B, a receptacle for refuse, a dustbin, also an enclosure in a backyard or basement for holding dustbins or domestic refuse. Two, excerpts. In 1927, quote, if there was an object on earth which Monshog loathed, it was a slatternly dirty woman. What's to be done with that rampallion midden, Lisbeth, said he, end quote. In 1959, quote, that everlasting midden, which men call the world, end quote. Three, in archeology, span a prehistoric refuse heap, which marks an ancient settlement consisting chiefly of shells and bones and often also discarded artifacts. In zoology and paleontology, a heap of excreta, food remains or other organic debris left by an animal, especially a deposit composed, most, composed largely of or cemented by the urine of small mammals, such as pack rats. One day, if anyone survives the climate apocalypse that is upon us, anthropologists may look through our garbage made into midden for study. They will examine these bits to understand us and perhaps also why we likely disappeared. As Leanne Simpson has said elsewhere, we have experienced the apocalypse already. And by we, she means the Anishinaabek. She writes from, to, and for the Anishinaabek. In Alaska, my home, the forces of illness, enslavement, and deep grief were shocks that repeated across generations, nestled within the seismic convulsions of Russian and American colonization. This disturbance, this distortion has been called the Great Death. Marianne Barkhouse and I visited about bison, beavers, and wolves on Turtle Island. How they were killed for bone, for fur, and for nuisance, and the devastation that ensued. Some of us have endured, some of us have survived. Perhaps in a future, we may never know, like coy wolves or crow ravens, bison or beaver, some of us will survive. But perhaps the colonizers who have not yet survived an apocalypse, whose history or memory have not endured, 
Perhaps someone needs to tell them that the great death is upon us. Our mother is not a midden. That's so beautiful, hey, I like, I really love it. I'm going to read two other short pieces from Tanya and then I'll move into my own work. Tanya is also a choreographer and she works in performance and many of her pieces are scores. So I'll read two of those short scores. This is an event score for indigenous epistemologies for Eber Hampton. A person enters and reads. The audience listens but does not look. Then the audience looks only to follow with its body. Then the audience's body turns to the east. Then the audience holds its heart. Then the audience listens but does not look. An event score for haunting. A person enters and reads. The audience remembers relentlessly. Then the audience feels no ease. Then what can decolonization mean other than the return of stolen land? Then what must it feel like to be haunted? Oh my God, I love that. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> We should all we should all uh, go stalk her on social media somewhere and just do. Yay! Good job. <laughs> okay, here we go. So uh, I don't want to take too much of our time because of of course we have another beautiful reader coming. So, but I am going to share actually uh, a few pieces, and I'm going to share screen because they come from visual work. So I'm gonna share the, those visual pieces so that you have an idea where the, the poem and the form comes from. And I, I wish to have a disclaimer. I have read these pieces a number of times um, in the last year or so. And so if you ever see, if you've seen any of my readings and these look familiar, I apologize. <laughs> I do actually write new things sometimes. Uh, but I am sharing this specifically because uh, this is a project taken, uh, um, made out of um, consideration or meditation on the idea of being a relative and being related to others. And in our language, um, it, this exhibit was on the idea of midakuye oyasin, which translates to we are all related or all my relatives, something like that. I'm gonna share this. And one day I will share new work. We'll, we'll get there, right? Here we go. Let's see. Can you see that? I see some yeses, okay. I'm gonna try, um, uh, what's it called? What is it called? Slideshow. Let's try a slideshow. Oh, you get to see a bunch of my work, but we're just gonna do this one. Okay, so this was Midakuye Oyasin, what I was saying. This is an exhibit I participated in with uh, two other Lakota artists. And 
basic the pieces that I'm going to share with you today come from this specific um, piece. This actually measures 12 feet high by 12 feet wide. It actually is really large. It was so large we couldn't fit it in that we had to angle it downward <laughs> in, in the gallery. Um, and those little dots, do you see those little white dots in the, the piece? Um, that's actually text that I laser cut out of the, um, the, 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 the little diamonds. All of these are diamonds sewn together into what is called a star quilt, which is a familiar um, kind of thing in our community that we share on special occasions. We give to our relatives often. Um, so I took one of those star quilt patterns and I expanded the diamonds. And um, um, I wrote these poems after listening to interviews with six women in our community who are all uh, fluent speakers of our language. They are all educators and they were all sharing something about our philosophy on being related, not just to, as I said earlier, human beings, but to all of creation, even the stars. We call those our star relatives. <laughs> and so I'm going to share um, some of those. Oh, this is the colorful one. That wasn't laser cut. This was a uh, stencil work. And I always like to share this too, just quickly that um, this, the multicolored one was called mosquitoes because mosquitoes are also considered our relatives. Yeah, like it or not, we all have some mosquitoes in our lives. You know them, you know who they are. <laughs> some are even in your own family. Sometimes you have to work with some mosquitoes, right? But they don't, they have a place in this world and they don't have to ruin the whole picnic, right? So that's okay. So anyway, I had a, uh, that. Oh, this is Mary's work, one of the other artists. Look at that, isn't that cool? Okay, so I'm gonna read, this is one of the speakers in the community, Jace, uh, sharing a little bit about what it is to be a relative. Oh, these are the other artists, Mary and Clementine Bordeaux. Beautiful, beautiful people. And I, I felt so honored to work with them. Here we go. And so the way this form works, as I said, it came directly from that, um, the visual pieces in the gallery. Uh, and it, the way it works, I made it so that you start at the top and you can weave your way down, the viewer or the reader, and you can make your own poem, okay? And you can do, I don't know how many, like maybe 10 or 12 combinations. And so I'm going to read a few of those pieces and make my own combinations. And I have no set pattern. It's different every time I read, but I'm gonna give this a try. Here we go. As we embrace the future, we work to understand the grief we shift into light across our faces. As we embrace the future, we struggle to find the grief. We shift into light across our faces. As we embrace the present, we struggle to unbraid the grief we wield into light across our faces. As we resist the present, we struggle to accept the grief we wield as ash across our faces. As we resist the past, we begin to unbraid the grief we wield as ash across our faces. As we resist the past, 
we fail to question the grief we bury as ash across our faces. As I hope to speak my heart, I remember to sing as a child to understand these are stories. As I hope to change my tongue, I long to sing as a child to understand these are stories. As I hope to change my eyes, I pause to sing as a mourner to understand these are stories. As I cease to believe my eyes, I pause to sing as a mourner to endure these are stories. As I cease to believe my intuition, I forget to sing as a soldier to endure these are stories. I'm gonna maybe end with this because this is about community. Um, it is also about Ocheti Shakoin. It is also about our language um, and where you see the line with our dictionary and aspects of, um, I would say, finding ourselves, reclaiming who we are and all the navigation we have to do uh, in between. Um, so here we are. This year, we held close our traditions to guard our family's future, an unwritten poem birthing us the body. This year, we held close our traditions to determine our land's future, an unwritten poem birthing us the body. This year, we held close our new dictionary to determine our community's future, labor pains birthing us the body. This year, we strained against our new dictionary to examine our community's future, labor pains birthing us the body. This year, we strained against law and treaty to examine the Ocheti Shakowin future, labor pains trapping us, the body. This year, we strained against law and treaty to redress our country's future, a splitting tree trapping us, the body. Okay, thank you. I hope I didn't go too long, but um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Leili. That was amazing. Um, next, we will hear from our final poet today. Benjamin Kruzling is a poet and artist working in sound and video. His first book, Glaring, is out now from Wendy's Subway. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Emily. Um, thank you, Bailey. Uh, this is the fifth time I've heard you read. I think it's always luminous. So. Appreciate hearing you again today. Um, thanks, Bennett, for inviting us, and Shiv and Myra for your readings, too. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, I won't go too long. I'm going to start with a quote from this essay by the scholar Joy James called The Dead Zone, um, which I think will maybe frame a few of the other poems I'm going to read from different poets, and then I'm going to read a few poems from my book. So shouldn't be too long. Um, 
So from Joy James, The Dead Zone. In the Black Jacobins, C.L.R. James remarks of historians, they write so well because they see so little. What is often unspoken and so unseen is the pervasiveness of violence. If genocide is taken off the table for discussion, then there is no immediacy in the struggle. Here's the point. Time does not exist, but genocidal violence does. The golden age is American mythology. There is no evolutionary future, only the immediate struggle. Resisting violence is a mandate. If our writing suffers because we see more than we can articulate, that's fine. At least we tried residing in the dead zone at the nexus where the flight from violence meets the deeper immersion within it. Our only achievement will be to stop fetishizing achievement and romanticizing or condemning dysfunction and despair. The crossroads dead zone becomes a threshold, a potential site for working for emancipation. Um, thinking about this, this essay a lot lately, even in the sense of, you know, Reverend Warnock just won in Georgia, black senator, but over the course of his campaign, he threw Palestinians under the bus to sort of advance his career in American politics. Um, and so I think what Joy James' essay helps us think through is partly what the sort of effective investment is in these kinds of dead end electoral politics, which are important to pay attention to at the same time as we kind of conceptualize a way to, you know, how do we really start to think outside and see what's actually going on when um, Black achievement is sort of undergirded by this Black mass of suffering kind of globally. So I think the poems I'm going to read now rhyme with that in a lot of interesting ways. Um, the first is from the poet Camden Hilliard. Cam goes by Cam. Um, and this is in that new anthology from Nightboat, uh, We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics that Andrea um, Abi Karam and Kay Gabriel edited. It's called The Tetsuo Hirano Tunnels Are Colonial Infrastructure. It's at the bottom of this page too. I'm going to share it in the chat by Camden Hillier. This road takes me home. This road is a bypass and this road is under construction. Thus the lane ahead closes, narrows in one mouth and out the other. The US military made it through the mountain with blasting bellies full of fluff piece and infrastructure because the US military put their objects where your objects is, because the US military say good night, because the US military say wine is coffee life and in between the heart is a lonely house hunter where we settled on freezing all the heads. Something about stock, but I've grown sick from eating, eating, eating through the dead. The next poem is by this poet. I don't want to say undersung, but she is a bit undersung. I think we should sing more about her. Um, her name is Julia Fields. I think this poem is from the 70s, maybe. It's called High on the Hog. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to kind of actively read through the typos on this page. So excuse me if this reading is not uh, perfect. High on the Hog. Take my share of soul food. I do not wish to taste of pig, of either gut or grunt from bow or jowl. I want caviar, shrimp, souffle, sherry champagne. And not because these are the whites domain, but just because I'm entitled for I've been VD'd enough, TB'd enough, and hoe cake fed, knock kneed enough, spindly leg bloodhound treed enough to eat high on the hog. I've been hired last, fired first enough. I've sugar watered my thirst enough, been lynched enough, slaved enough, cried enough, died enough, been deprived, have survived enough to eat high on the hog. Keep the black eyed peas in the grits, the high blood pressure chops and gravy sops. I want aperitifs, supreme baked Alaska, something suave, cool, 
for I've been considered faithful fool from 40 acres and a mule. I've been slighted enough, severated enough, and uptighted enough, and I want high on the hog for dragging the cotton sack on bended knees and burning sun in homage to the great King Cotton for priming the money green tobacco and earning pocket change for washing in iron pots, for warming by coal and soot, for eating the leavings from others' tables. I've lived my wretched life between domestic rats and foreign wars, carted to my final rest in secondhand cars, but I've been leached enough, Dixie peached enough, color bleached enough, and I want high on the hog. Oh, I've heard the Mau Mau screaming, romanticizing pain. I hear them think they go against the grain but I've lived in shacks long enough, had strong black beaten backs long enough, and I've been urban planned, been moin a hand enough, and I want high on the hog. So good. Okay, last one. That's not mine, from Wanda Coleman. Um, I was just obsessed with this poem last year. Terrence Hayes did the selected edition of her work. And uh, I'm not gonna read it as well as she does. It's on YouTube if you're interested, but I'm gonna read it now. Wanda Coleman, they came knocking on my door at 7 a.m. They had a warrant out for my arrest. What's your name? Where's your identification? I was half naked so they didn't come inside figuring they caught me mid-fuck. They were right. Coitus interruptus, LAPD is a drag. I showed them alias number three. They said, oh, well, where is she? I said, man, she was staying here, but she hooked up with some nigga and split. Okay, okay. They left. I went back into the bedroom. You were naked and still hungry, curious. What was that all about? Nothing. I laughed took off the rag I was wearing, eased into the sheets next to you. We started fucking again, but things had changed. Okay, I'm reading two or three poems from this book, Glaring. This is my book, just came out. Beautiful, thank you. To Heaven on a Mule, Spurious, Helen Johnson. My dream of heaven was an ice cream factory, but it echoed blackface heaven from a few minutes earlier. And all wishes, brained on the marvel of televised limbo, where production assistants line up lights and vanish, drag social pain into procedures that taste great on camera. People, in that sense, Reviewing memory produces artifacts, long static renditions of blackface heaven. So they try to shred the bush years with vocal runs. It's a room with floor to ceiling mirrors and people spread their arms there to sing, to place the face at the center, to tell the world childhood is sweet, though it tastes like power over, though it tastes like pistachio. These are eyes I make the world so careful with, long static, long talk. Well, you say you want a strong feeling, have one or someone will think you're withholding. It's like fed logic, depression fighting escapism. Childhood is so sweet, they say, as they go house to house, killing on a thick recursive loop and their faces drip, they're wet with effort. This one is called uh, Millenarian Amoxicillic Blues. Very missing caramel, very ugly Sunday. Hostile, can I help you from a man in a suit at a building downtown? But we're under a similar heel. I'm a vandal. The grid is on ice with my common plantings. No machine can make me whole. In the DC summer, I was devastated. That fire brought lines to my face and workers and these liberal fits and patterns on the same page of quote pragmatism. I'm a black taxpayer 
but when I woke from my dream of jogger shopping, I was still in this world of enclosure with the coast in me, the climax. Then I think the police are strong with this one. It's drama, everything's getting cloned. And in the New York summer, I was devastated. And in the Cincinnati summer, I was devastated. And in the Iowa summer, but not to fix it, the zoo paid my grandma a lot to leave her home. That old blue house was barely even blue as it fell off the side of the road. When you think of peace, you're sick, my friend, your face is lit with the revolution's problems. As for me who loves to not suffer, I'm bathed in the brilliant lights of attention where racist painters craft a stupid response. The circus is returning with bells and bombs on calling on us all to carry that cold to the subway and home. This poem is called, God, can you please hurry and find, I wasn't sure that we could be. Can we say we, me more than all the others? Can we subject style to such rigorous accounting, beach the vessel to save it? Asking such questions, I think, might be the plenum of the just, the right, the only rights. A role model fucked my life up, increasingly wary of the males, my money, moral projects, my manner, draped and derided by sitcoms, phantasms, spending everything on time. So I was full of anger, grief, couldn't put tongue or wound in a public picture put pressure on the word. I'm in a store, state, or database. They give me an eye, time's very hot moment. Can we call that a hurry? All night dreaming of a body. All night dreaming of my mother. She's in the car. I'm in the CVS for her. Then the manager thinks I've stolen. And I have, it's true love. Sometimes we believe we're happy by loving. We reach out to each other in goodness. We work together to correct our misunderstandings. But people don't always listen like that. They tell you war is natural and never ending. I found it hard all my life. I hated it so much. And this is the last one. Called Pleasure is Stubborn in Retrospect. First there's love, then there's synchronized time, then there's troops barely secretly in Yemen, Niger, the pre-turnstile zone of the subway. That's happening also. There are people out in the sense that love can't be from them, can't be seen assuming any kind of grace. When you broke, you just feel abandoned, acrylic reds, yellows. I love you because you're on the other side of the room because steam comes off you in the twilight gone green with night vision. I fall asleep by three, wake up by nine, cause the cars go by so harshly. Then I think love is coming from me, love is streaming from me. It's there, but there's no time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Benjamin. That was amazing and Thank you, Laylee, Shiv, and Myra. Thank you, Bennett, for bringing this wonderful group of poets together today. And thank you to all who tuned in. Um, this October marked the Rails 20th anniversary and we'll be celebrating all the way into 2021. Please consider making a year end contribution or a year beginning contribution, I guess, to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent like the NSE lunchtime series and We the Immigrants Project. Every amount matters to us and you can check the chat for more information or ask one of our team. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for Common Ground Curatorial Activism Part 2 a conversation between legendary feminist curators, Camille Morineau, Daria Khan, Catherine DeZager, Rosa Martinez, and Anne Sutherland Harris, moderated by Maura Riley. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Eileen Miles. And you should all now be able to 
turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great readings all. Layli, Ben, Thanks for been a great curation. Thanks everybody. Myra, I loved it. Bye bye. <laughs> we loved it so much. Hey, thank you so much for the beautiful I reading.